The Lancashire Witches by Harrison Ainsworth. Chapter 2. The Eruption. Demdike went a little farther down the hill, stopping when he came to the green park. He then plunged his staff into the sod at the first point where he had cast a tuft of heather, and with such force that it sank more than three feet. The next moment he plucked it forth as if with a great effort, and a jet of black water spouted into the air. But heedless of this, he went to the next marked spot, and again plunged the sharp point of the implement into the ground. Again it sank to the same depth, and on being drawn out, a second black jet sprang forth. Meanwhile, the hostile party continued to advance up the dry channel before mentioned, and shouted on beholding these strange preparations. But they did not relax their speed. Once more, the staff sank into the ground, and a third black fountain followed its extraction. By this time, the royalist soldiers were close at hand, and the features of their two leaders, John Braddle and Richard Ashton, could be plainly distinguished, and their voices heard. Tis he, tis the rebel abbot, spoke he freighted, Braddle, pressing forward. We were not misinformed. He has been watching by the beacon. The devil has delivered him into our hand. Oh ho, laughed them die. Abbot no longer. Tis the Earl of Poverty, you mean, responded Ashton. The villain shall be gibbeted on the spot where he has fired the beacon, as a warning to all traitors. Ha, heretics, ha, blasphemers, I can at least avenge myself upon you, cried Parsloo, striking spurs into his charger. Before he could execute his purpose, Demdike had swung forward, and catching the bridle, restrained the animal by a powerful effort. Hold, he cried in a voice of thunder, or you will share their fate. As the words were uttered, a dull, booming, subterranean sound was heard, and instantly afterwards, with a crash like thunder, the whole of the green circle beneath slipped off, and from a yawning rent under it, burst forth with irresistible fury of the inky coloured torrent, which, rising almost breast eye, fell upon the devoted royalist soldiers who were advancing right in its course. Unable to avoid the watery eruption, or to resist its fury when it came upon them, they were instantly swept from their feet and carried down the channel. A sight of horror was it to behold the sudden rise of that swarthy stream, whose waters tinged by the ruddy glare of the beacon fire looked like waves of blood. No less fearful was it to hear the first wild despairing cry raised by the victims, or the quickly stifled shrieks and groans that followed, mixed with the deafening roar of the stream and the crashing fall of the stones which accompanied its course. Down, down went the poor wrenchers, now utterly overwhelmed by the torrent, now regaining their feet only to utter a scream, and then be swept off. Here a miserable struggler, whirled onward, would clutch at the banks and try to scramble forth, but the sort of giving way beneath him, he was hurried off to eternity. The habit and his companions beheld this work of destruction and amazement and dread. Blanched terror sat in their cheeks, and the blood was frozen in Paslow's veins, for he thought it the work of the powers of darkness, and that he was lead with them. He tried to mutter a prayer, but his lips refused their office. He would have moved, but his limbs were stiffened and paralysed. He could only gaze aghast at terrible spectacle. Amidst it all, he heard a wild burst of unearthly laughter proceeding, and he thought from them died, and it filled him with new dread. But he could not check the sound, neither could he stop his ears. Though he would fain have done so, like him, the companions were petrified and speechless fear. After this had endured for some time, though, still the black torrent rushed on impetuously as ever. Demdike turned to the abbot and said, Your vengeance has been fully gratified. You will now baptize my child. Never, never a curse being, shrieked the abbot. Thou mayest sacrifice her at thine own impious rites. But see, there is one poor wrench yet struggling with the foaming torrent. I may save him. That is John Braddle, thy worst enemy, replied Demdike. If he lives, he shall possess half worldly abbot. Thou hast best also save Richard Asseton, who yet clings to the great storm below. As if he escapes, he shall have the other half. Mark him, and make haste, for in five minutes both shall be gone. I will save them if I can. Be the consequence to myself what it may, replied the abbot. And regardless of the derisive laughter of the other, who yelled in his ears as he went, Bless shall see thee hanged at thy own door. He dashed down the hill to the spot where a small object, distinguishable above the stream, showed that someone still kept his head above water, his tall stature having preserved him. Is it you, John Braddle? cried the abbot as he rode up. I, replied the head, forgive me for the wrong I intended you, and deliver me from this great peril. I am come for that purpose, replied the abbot, dismounting and disencumbering himself of his heavy cloak. By this time the two herdsmen had come up, and the abbot, taking a crook from one of them, clutched hold of the bellow, and plunging fearlessly into the stream, extended it forward the drowning man, who instantly lifted up his hand to grasp it. In doing so, Braddle lost his balance, but as he did not quit his hold, he was plucked forth from the tenacious mud by the combined efforts of the abbot and his assistant, and with some difficulty dragged ashore. Now for the other, cried Parsloo, as he placed Braddle in safety. One half the abbey is gone from the shouted a voice in his ears as he rushed on. Presently he reached the rocky fragment on which Richard Asseton rested. The latter was in great danger from the surging torrent, and the stone on which he had taken refuge tottered at its base, and threatened to roll over. In heaven's name help me, Lord Abbot, as thou myself shall be open at thy need, shrieked Asseton. Be not afraid, Richard Asseton, replied Parsloo. 
closely. I will deliver thee as I have delivered John Bradle. But the task was not of easy accomplishment. The abbot made his preparations as before, grasped the hand of the herdsman, and held out the crook to Asterton. But when the letter caught it, the stream swung him round with such force that the abbot must either abandon him or advance farther into the water. Bent on Asherton's preservation, he adopted the latter expedient and instantly lost his feet. While the herdsman, unable longer to hold him, let go the crook and the abbot and Asherton were swept down the stream together. Here, only unable to assist himself, Asherton was seized by a black hound belonging to a tall man who stood up on the bank and who shouted to Paslo as he held the animal to bring the drowning man ashore. The other half of the abbot is gone from thee. Wilt thou baptize my child if I send my dog to save thee? Never replied the other, sinking as he spoke. Flashes of fire glanced in the abbot's eyes, and stunning sounds seemed to burst his ears. A few more struggles, and he became senseless. But he was not destined to die thus. What happened afterwards he knew not. But when he recovered full consciousness, he found himself stretched with aching limbs and throbbing head upon a couch in a monistic room with a richly painted and gilded ceiling, with shields at corners, emblazoned with three luches of Wale, and with panels hung with tapestry from the looms of Landers, representing drivers, scriptural subjects. Have I been dreaming? He mumbled. No, replied a tall man standing by his bedside. Thou hast been saved from one death to suffer another more ignominious. Ha! cried the abbot, starting up and pressing his head to his temples. Thou here, I, I am appointed to watch thee, replied MD. Thou art a prisoner in thine own chamber at Worley. All has befallen as I told thee. The Earl of Derby is master of the abbey. The adherents are dispersed, and thy brethren are driven forth. The two partners in rebellion, the abbots of Jervos and Sale, have been conveyed to Lancaster Castle, whither thou wilt go as soon as thou canst be moved. I will surrender all silver and gold, land and possession to the king, if I may die in peace, groaned the abbot. It is not needed, rejoining the other. Attain the felony, thy hands and abbey will be forfeited to the crown, and they shall be sold, as I have told thee, John Bradle and Richard Asseton, who will be rulers here in thy sea. Would I had perished in the flood, groaned the abbot, for mayest thou wish so return his tormentor, but thou wert not destined to die by water. As I have said, thou shalt be hanged at thy own door, and my wife shall witness thy end. Who art thou? I have heard thy voice before, cried the abbot. It is like the voice of one whom I knew years ago, and thy features are like his, though changed greatly. Changed, who art thou? Thou shalt know before thou diest, replied other, with a look of gratified vengeance. Farewell, and reflect on thy fate. So saying, he stood towards the door, while the miserable abbot arose, and marching with uncertain steps to a little oratory adjoining, which he himself built, knelt down before the altar, and strove to pray. Chapter 3. Worley Abbey. A sad, sad change had come over the fair abbey of Worley. It knoweth its old masters no longer, but upwards of two centuries and a half after the blessed place were in beauty and riches. Seventeen abbots have exercised unbounded hospitality within it, but now they are all gone, save one, and he is attained of felony and treason. The grave monk walker no more in the cloisters, nor seek of his pallet in the dormitory. Vesper or matin song resound not as of old within the fine conventual church. Stripped are the altars of their silver crosses and the shrines of their votive offsprings and saintly relics. Pikes and chalice, verbal and vile, golden-headed pastoral staff and mitre embossed with pearls, candlestick and Christmas ship of silver, salver, basin and ewer, all are gone. The splendid sacristy have been defiled. Never had Worley Abbey looked more beautiful than on a bright, clear morning in March. When this sad change had been wrought, and when from a peaceful monastic establishment it had been converted into a menacing fortress, the sunlight sparked on its grey walls, and filled its three great quadrangular courts with light and light, piercing the exquisite carving of its cloisters, and revealing all the intricate beauty and combinations of the arches. Stains of painted glass fell upon the floor of the magnificent conventual church, and dyed with rainbow hues the marble tombs of the laces the founders of the establishment brought thither when the monastery was removed from Sandlaw in Cheshire, and upon the brass-covered gravestones of the abbots in the presbytery. There lay Gregory D. Northbury, 8th abbot of Sandlaw, the first of Worley, and William Reed, the last abbot, but there was never to lie John Paslew. The slumber of the ancient prelates was soon to be disturbed, and the sacred structure within which they had so often worshipped was reared by a sacrilegious hand. But all was bright and beauteous now, and if no solemn stains were heard in the holy pile, its stillness was scarcely less reverential and awe-inspiring. The old abbey read itself in all its attractions, so if to welcome back its former ruler, whereas it was only to receive him as a captive doomed to a felon's death, but this was outward sure. Within no 
all the terrible preparation, such was the discontented state of the country, that fearing some new revolt, the Earl of Derby had taken measures for the defence of the Abbey, and along the wide circling walls of the clothes were placed ordnance and men, and within the grange stores of ammunition, a strong guard was set at each of the gates, and the courts were filled with troops. The bray of the trumpet echoed within the clothes, where rounds were set for the archers, and martial music resounded within the area of the cloisters. Over the great north-eastern gateway, which formed the chief entrance to the abbot's lodging, floated the royal banner despite these warlike proceedings. The fair abbey smiled beneath the sun in all, or more than all, its pristine beauty, its green hills sloping gently down towards it, and the clear and sparkling calder dashing merrily over the stones at its base. But upon the bridge, and by the riverside, and within the little village, many persons were assembled, conversing gravely and anxiously together, and looking out towards the hills where other groups were gathered, as if in expectation of some afflicting event. Most of these were herdsmen and farming men, but some among them were poor monks in the white habits of the Cistercian Brotherhood, but which were now stained and threadbare. While their countenances bore traces of severe privation and suffering, all the herdsmen and farmers had been retainers of the abbot. The poor monks looked wistfully at their former habitation, but replied not except by a gentle bowing of the head to the cruel scoffs and taunts with which they were greeted by the passing soldiers. But the sturdy rustics did not bear these outrages so tamely, and more than one brawl ensured in which blood flowed, while a ruffianly arquebusier would have been drowned in the calder, but for their exertions to save him of a monk whom he had attacked. This took place on the 11th of March, 1537, more than three months after the date of the watching by the beacon being recorded, and the event anticipating by the concourse without the abbey, as well as by those within its walls, was the arrival of Abbot Haslow and Fathers Eastgate and Haydock, who were to be brought on that day from Lancaster and executed on the following morning before the abbey. According to sentence passed upon them, the gloomiest object in the picture remains to be described, but yet it is necessary to its completion. This was a gallows of unusual form and height, erected on the summit of a gentle hill, rising immediately in front of the abbot's lodgings called the Hall Houses, whose rounded awesome beauty it completely destroyed. This terrible apparatus of condign punishment was regarded with abhorrence by the rustics, and it required a strong guard to be kept constantly around it to preserve it from demolition. Amongst a group of rustics collected on the road leading to the north-east gateway was Cuthbert Ashby, who having been deprived of his forester's office was now habited in a frieze doublet and horse, with a short camlet cloak on his shoulder and a fox skin cap, embellished with the grinning jaws of the beast on his head. Eight rookot or rouse, he observed to a bystander, that's a fair for seat that gallows, yean been up to the whole house, to take a look at its belike. Now, no, a done the lots of seats, replied Rookot of Rouse. Beside there were a great rabblement at he great, and one of them moonjus archer chaps knocked me on to knob with his hawk, and told me it hung me with it. Abbot is a dinner keep out of way, and served he great to Lord Craddon Carl cried as she doubling his own fist. Odds flesh when dinya your has a tussle with him. He months are itching for a bow with the hectic robbers. Walladay, walladay, that ye should live to see the only feathers driven like hummer bees out of her own nest, when the same of King Harry on this week ought were to have no more more for for as I or Englandshire. Only think of that, and don't you know that the abbots of Javox and Sally were caught on Tuesday at Lancaster Castle. Good lordious lessons, exclaimed the sturdy kind. Were a plotty king first he chops off his wife's head, and then hangs his own priest. Call to war he come to, a fire to mess one which he come to cry one shot routes we darn open old moors for fear of the god. Now be lady, for eyes open moist wide and no and cried as he and if a dozen of your chaps will join me and trying to set the poor abbot free whom they brings him here. A as leave boy till tomorrow, said Richard of Ralph's uneasily. I thou a Timerson take a us a town to leave or replied as he but what does they all say how long now see I do to the third and we were beaten with sword. Iron splitting the last drop of my blood at all Abbas was replied Hal on Nabs. We winna stood by and see him hung like a dog. Abbot wants to restore lads. Eight Abbot Passlow to the rescue responded all the others except Rushart or Ross. This must be prevented, muttered a voice near them, a 
and immediately afterwards, tall man went to the group. Whoa, whoa, it's war cried Howlin' Nabs. Oh, hey, seeing that he wish Nick them die. Nick them die, he uh, cried as he was round in alarm. Has he overheard us? Like, no, cried Howlin' Nabs. A dinner man in the war. No, I neither cried the shot or Ralph's tossing himself and sitting on the ground. All needy, all war shells from the warlock. Talking on Nick them die, cried Howlin' Nabs. A strange adventure we him to meet for to rape Brass the Pendle Hill had no your bird Yet fire will take him he had a required as he though us hear uh, all about him if it will A were sent be to Abbot down hill to Owen or Gabs or Perkins or Donald or Noel or Humphreys or should I was and long to look after him will one A get over to stone were what done you think he sees twenty or forty parchment standing behind it and they dashes at me as thick as leaves and if four it can't root out they blind fold of me and clap an iron god in my mouth will I can neither speak nor see four and can't use my feet soy a hunters as and read and laugh and be my torch and lads you'd a light way to hear how they roar and I should a roar too if I could on they began to whack me with their rattling powers and ding me so about the head they a fell I a swan mm, a come to a loin or me back I remember to maul every boon and me hoardy ranch and me who were war what a we all what he he gone and he god were gone so he gets on me feet and daddle along on us wheels or he can't when all the ones he spies a lead went in before me and dancing about like an arc of gold or whispering say that's Frere Rush and his lantern and he'll lead me into a quagmire so he stops a bit consider where he better for he didn't know to Broad exactly but one A stood still to me, stood still to on them he made out that he come from an outer room tower and what he fancied were one lantern crew twenty four. One he reached the tower and peeped in through a broken window. He beheld a seat I sir near forget a hack of witches. Eight witches sitting in a ring with their broomsticks and lanterns about them. Good lord your stays, cried Hal or Nabs. In what else did a see mon? War replied Ashby to old hags had a little figure. I had he missed on a mode I clay representing it. Abbot of Worley, he gnawed it be Martu and Crossier, and after each of the varmint had stick a pin in its heart, a tall black man stepped forward and teed a cord drawn in his throttle and hung it up. And T Black Mon cried Hallow Nabs breathlessly. T Black Mon were nick them die. Yawn guessed it, replied Ashby, to where he he were so cloppened he couldn't speak, and my blood froze at my veins. When he heard a fur war voice, as Nick where his wife and chit were, the infant is unbaptized, roared a voice. At the next meeting it must be sacrificed. See that thou bring it, them die, them bow to summer. I couldn't see and asked when the next meeting were to be held. On the night of Abbot Haslow's execution, answered the voice on hearing this. He could bear no longer but shouting out wishes, devils, Lord deliver us for ye. And as he spoke, he tried to pass through to Winder in a trice. All tea leaves went out. Far whirl, a great rush to the door, a whirling sound. Ah, the air, like a covey of partridges, fleeing off. And then he heard no more, for a great stone fell on my son and knocked me down senseless. When I come to, I were, I, in the Demdike's cottage, with his wife watching over me, and the unbaptized child, I, her arms, all exclamations of wonder on the part of the rustics, and inquiries as to the issue of the adventure, were checked by the approach of a monk who, joining the assemblage, called their attention to a priestly train slowly advancing along the road. It is headed, he said, by fathers, Chatburn and Chester, late verses of the abbey, Allah, Allah, they now need the charity themselves, which they once so lavishly bestowed on others. Was me, ejaculated Ashi, money abroad murk and a get em for em. They ain't been con to us or added others. Next come Father Burnley, Granger, and Father Hanwood Zellara to share the monk, and after them Father Dingley, Sacristan, and Father Moore Porter. Yo, remember Father Moore, lads cried Ashi. Ye to be sure we don't reply the others. A good month, a really good month. He never sent away the poor, no he after Father Moore said the Monk, pleased with their warmth, and Father Forrest, the procurator, with Father Reed, Wolf, and Bancroft, and the procession is closed by Father Smith, a late prior. Down a year, whirly bones, lads, as the only favours pass.
cried as she engraved their blessing. As the priestly train slowly approached with heads bowed down, the looks fixed sadly upon the ground, the rustic assemblage fell upon their knees and implored their benediction. The foremost in the procession passed on in silence, but the prior sought and extended his hands over the kneeling group and cried in a solemn voice, Heaven bless ye, my children, you are about to witness a sad spectacle, you will see him who have brought you, fed you, and taught you the way to heaven, brought hither to a prisoner to suffer a shameful death. Both ways set him free on the prior cried as he, we're in need of our minds to it, your just way till he comes. Nay, I command you to deceive on the attempt, if any such you meditate, rejoin the prior, it will avail nothing, and you will only sacrifice your own lives. Our enemies are too strong, the abbot himself would give you like counsel. Scarcely were the words uttered than from the great gate of the abbey there issued a dozen arquebusiers with an officer at their head who marched directly towards the kneeling hands, evidently with the intention of dispersing them. Behind them stood Nicholas M. Dye. In an instant the alarmed pussies were on their feet and bloodshot or rouse and some few amongst them took to their heels, but Ashley, Howell and Nabs, with half a dozen others, stood their ground manfully. The monks remained in the hope of preventing any violence. Presently the Halberdiers came up. That is the ringleader, cried the officer, who proved to be Richard Asterton, pointed out as he seized him. Now man shall lay on Sunday, cried Bert, and as the guards pushed past the monks to execute their leader's order, he sprang forward and, wrestling a halberd from the foremost of them, stood upon his defence, seize him, I say, shouted Asterton, irritated at the resistance offered. Keep off, cried Ashley, you best like a stay at bay and dangerous war homes, war homes, they say. The arc viziers looked irresolute. It was evident Ashley would only be taken with life, and they were not sure that it was their leader's purpose to destroy him. Put down thy weapons, cover in towards the prior. It will avail thee nothing against odds like these. Maybe only prior, rejoined Ashley, flourishing the pie. Both eyes only yield one life. I will disarm them, cried Demdi. Stepping forward, floor resorted Ashby with a sombre laugh. Come on, then, I'd stir up with friends. I held at the back, he should fear thee. Yield, cried Emdy in a voice of thunder, and fixed a terrible glance upon him. Come on, wizard, rejoined Ashby undauntedly, but observing that his opponent was wholly unarmed, he gave the pike to Howland House, who was close beside him, observing, It shall never be said that Bert Ashby fought the jewel himself fairly. Now touch me if they dare. Step dark required no verbal preparation. With almost supernatural force and quickness, he sprang upon the forest and seized him by the boat. But the active young man freed himself from the grip and closed with his assailant. But through of Ecul and Bill, it soon became evident that Ashley would have the worst of it. When Hal and Nabs, who had watched the struggle with intense interest, could not help coming to his friend's assistance and made a push at MD with a halberd. Could it be that the wrestlers shifted their position, or that the wizard was indeed aided by the powers of darkness? None could tell, but so it was that the pike pierced the side of Ashley, who instantly fell to the ground with his adversary upon him. The next instant, his hold relaxed, and the wizard sprang to his feet on heart, but he moved in blood. Hal and Nabs uttered a cry of he anguish, and flinging himself on the body of the forester, tried to stanch the wound, but he was quickly seized by the arquebuses, and his hands tied behind his back with a thong. While Ashby was lifted up and borne towards the abbey, the monks and rustics following slowly after, but the latter were not permitted to enter the gate, as the unfortunate keeper, who by this time had become insensible from the loss of blood, was carried along the walled enclosure leading to the abbey lodging. A female with a child in her arms was seen advancing from the opposite side. She was all and formed the features of remarkable beauty, though of a masculine and somewhat savage character and with magnificent obvious black eyes. Her skin was dark and her hair raven black, contrasting strongly with a red band wound around it. Her kirtle was of a very colored surge, simply for the coming fashion. A glance sufficed to show her how matters stood before Ashley, and uttering the sharp and cry, she rushed towards him. What have you done? She cried, fixing a keen reproach to condemn Dai, who walked aside and wounded man. Nothing replied, and Dai would be so laughed. The world being hurt with pie, stand out the way best and let the men pass. They are about carrying to the cell under the chapter house. You shall not take him there, cried Bess and die fiercely. You may recover if his wound be dressed. Let him go to the infirmary. Ha, I forgot there is no one there now. Father Bancroft is at the gate, observed one of the arc viziers. Used to act as chirurgeon in the abbey. No monks enter the gate except prisoners when they arrive, observed Ashton. Such are the positive orders of the Earl of Derby. It is not needed, observed them, that no human aid can save a man, but can other aid save him, said Beth, screaming the words in her husband's ears.
go to Pride and Die, which is you know, on the side. We'll just have the beast save, I will but take heed, say best in the deep whisper. If thou save him not by the devil thou servest, thou shalt lose me and thy child. Demdike did not think proper to contest the point, but approaching Aston requested that the wounded man might be conveyed to an arched recess, which he pointed out. Ascent being given, Ashi was taken there and placed upon the ground, after which the art viziers and their leader marched off. While Bess kneeled down, tottered the head of the wounded man upon her knee, and Demdike taking a small phial from his ugler, poured some of its contents down his throat. The wizard then took a fold of linen with which he was likewise provided, and dipping it in the elixir, applied it to the wound. In a few moments, Ashi opened his eyes and looked round wildly, fixing his gaze upon Bess, who placed her finger upon her lips to enjoin the silence, but he could not or would not understand the sign. All is over with the best the woman, but I had rather do this with the side man than any other way. Hush, exclaimed Bess, Nicholas is here, all a C by the wound of man running around. Oh, what matters it is to God, I bet it's the last day. Ludus promised to break thy compact with Satan, to repent and save thy precious soul. I should be content. Oh, do not all those cry best, you will soon be well again. Listen to me, continued Ashley earnestly. Does not know her that if thy baby in the baptized the fall tomorrow and need it be sacrificed to the Prince of Darkness, or to summit the other feathers, confess thy sins and implore heaven's forgiveness, and mayhap they'll save thee and thy infant and be burned as a witch and join their sphere slay. It is useless, but I have tried them all. I have knelt to them, implored them, but their hearts are hard as flints. They will not heed me, they will not disobey the abbot's cruel injunctions. Though he be their superior no longer, but I shall be avenged upon him, terribly avenged. Leave me, for wicked woman, cried Ashley. I do not wish to have thee near me. Let me die in peace. Thou wilt not die, I tell thee, but I bear some of us. Have sanctified thy will. Don't be safe to cry as she rises. It never or me like it. Or he could be prevented, he tore off the bandage and my like, blood burst forth. And it is not my fault, he perished now, observed and died greedily. Help him, help him, implored Bess. If he shall not touch me, cried I see struggling and increasing the infusion. Keep him off, he adjured the farewell, Bess, he added, sinking back to her, exhausted by the effort. Cuthbert screamed Bess, terrified by his words. Cuthbert, art thou really dying? Look at me, see to me, how she cried as you see by a sudden idea. They say the blessing of the dying man will avail. Bless my child, Cuthbert, bless it. Give it to me, Roman, the forester. Bless held the infant towards him. But before he could place his hands upon it, all power forsook him, and he fell back and they fired. Lost, lost, forever lost, cried Bess with a wild shriek. At this moment, a loud blast was blown from the gate tower, and the trumpeter called out, The abbot and the two other prisoners are coming to their feet, when she cried them like imperiously, and seizing the bewildered woman by the arm to their feet, and come with me to meet him.